On today's video, we'll finish our landscape quilt skill building project. Most importantly, we'll make our foreground evergreen trees. And along the way, we'll get some help from Fritz, my Bernina Q20. Never mind me. This video is all about the trees and the thread. In my last video, we made the background using layers of cotton fabric. But the foreground trees are going to be all thread and yarn. One of the things we'll be using to help with that is this gadget right here. This is Bernina's number 43 couching foot. It lets you use one thread to sew something else, like a yarn or ribbon, down onto your fabric. I'll be using it for yarn today. Bernina makes a couple of variations of these feet, but they work a lot alike. The trick is that I don't want to stitch the trees directly onto the background. I want flexibility on where to place them, like an applique. I might even want to make extra and choose what to use. I'll get to how we do that in a minute. But for now, let's pick some threads. Okay, what I have here is a rather wide selection of threads and yarns that I'm going to use some of to make evergreen trees. That's a lot of thread. I won't be using all of these, but these are the colors I have available to work from as I start stitching. I was very happy with the brown yarn that just came today. It's called Sequoia by Lion Brand Heartland. It's acrylic, while these are wool yarns. These are 12-weight wool threads by Aurifil. These are Isocord 40-weight polyesters. I have one cotton hiding up here. I don't have that shade of green in any other thread. I have a few superior 40-weight polyesters, too. Really, you'll just need two or three greens, a couple of browns, plus one or two yarns. You'll just have to match which colors will look best in your particular circumstances. Next, since this project is about evergreen trees, let's talk a bit about some differences between evergreens and deciduous trees, like fruit trees. I've loaded some actual pictures so we can compare. Here are two evergreen trees. One is an evergreen growing in the wild along Skyline Drive in the Shenandoah Mountains, and the other a fir tree that has more of a traditional Christmas tree look to it. I've added a cherry tree for comparison, also growing wild along Skyline Drive. First, let's talk about the trunks and the branches. Evergreens usually have tall, straight trunks. The branches are often straight and grow at about the same angle to the trunk. Your evergreen trunks don't usually look like that. I admit I take a bit of artistic license. All right, sometimes more than a bit. But other people may want their trees to follow nature a bit more rigorously. The cherry tree is really different. Deciduous trees grow slower and often get thicker trunks and branches. The branches and even the trunks can bend and split into Ys. Evergreen branches can also split off Y branches. Yes, but usually the main branch stays straight and the sub-branch splits off. It's not a true Y. Also, the needles of an evergreen tend to grow in layers, like the branches. For deciduous trees, the leaves and flowers seem to cluster in clumps. I think that's a pretty good overview. Let's get ready to do this. I need some flexibility on where you place the foreground trees that I'm going to make on the background. That means we need to create some structure to stitch the trees onto that will let me use them like an applique. And the structure needs to disappear once they are down. Is that what the paper is for? No, the tree layout guide just helps me trace out the overall size and shape of each of the trees. So what do you actually stitch the trees to? I'm going to use two things to provide a backing for the trees. The first of which is this wash-away stabilizer. I have to get enough of it to cover a tree. And it needs some extra margin because we're going to use a basic embroidery hoop to help with the stitching. That piece looks like a tight fit for that tree. The first piece is for one of the smaller trees. It's just easier to unroll this way. Since there are two smaller trees, I need to cut another one just like it. For the large tree, I'll need to turn the roll the other direction. Now I want to trace the tree outline on it. You don't need a light table. This material is pretty see-through. The actual brand I'm using is Aquamesh by OESD. And you can just use the Sharpie for this. Both the stabilizer and anything marked on it will just dissolve later. This is just a guide that helps me align the size and center line of the tree. You can sketch it or you can use a ruler, whatever is easier. Now that these are marked, the next thing I do is cut pieces of this nylon veiling. I buy it by the bolt so it's a bit more economical. You can also get silk veiling, 
but it's usually more expensive than it's worth. I found scissors work better than a roller cutter with this nylon mesh. I want them to be about the same size as a stabilizer. Do both of them go in the hoop? Yes, but you want the stabilizer in back and then the veiling closer to you. All right, we're ready to stitch the first one. Here I'm going to make one of the two smaller trees. I use the same process for all of them, but this is one of the trees to either side of the large one. I'm using the couching foot to stitch down some of the brown wool yarn using a 40 weight variegated polyester that blends in with the same colors. One of the important things is that you want to have a fair amount of yarn unwound and just piled up loose over on the side before you start. You'll find you'll start pulling it in too quickly to unwind it off the skein. Since this is a smaller tree, I don't want the trunk to be too wide. Maybe four yarn widths. I have the stitch regulator set to BSR1 at 10 stitches per inch. Thanks, I also want a pretty slow idle speed. Maybe 250? Right, set to 250. I have to move the hoop to get to the lower half, but it's just a spring clip. You can see here with this branch what happens if you don't have enough yarn loose on the side. However, it's also easily fixable. Try just running over it again. So here's the branch structure for the small tree. For the smallest twigs at the end of the branches, I'm switching to 12 weight wool thread with just a regular free motion foot. Thank you. 
Point, we need to stitch the evergreen needles under the tree. I picked one of my 12 weight wool threads in a medium green color. For this you need a 9014 titanium top stitch needle. I reset the stitch regulator to 12 stitches per inch. I'm just stitching back and forth to put needles on the ends of the branches. It's a pretty easy form of thread painting. If you want to get more complicated on one of the trees, you can put down a darker green and then highlight the direction the light is coming from with a lighter thread.
What's next after this? When you're done stitching the needles down, the trees are basically ready, but there's a little bit of preparation before we stitch them down. First, you want to rinse them thoroughly to dissolve the stabilizer, and then lay them flat on top of some paper towels to dry. Do you need to iron them? No, there's enough starch left over from the stabilizer that they should dry flat. Once they are dry, take some small sharp scissors and carefully cut the veiling out around the trees. It's okay if there's a little veiling showing. It won't be visible when it's placed up against the background. So here I have the background we made in our first episode of this project. Using a ruler, I'm going to mark out the perimeter of the final quilt to help me place the trees. You started this with your normal bow in chalk, but then you switched. I changed my mind here because I think a Crayola washable gel pen will give me a more visible, precise line and will stay in place while I work on the quilt. We're going to cut that line anyway, so even if it wasn't washable, it wouldn't matter much. We have our margins about as far out as they can go. But you need to leave room for binding. Yes, these are the cut lines for squaring up the quilt. I'll need to place the trees, so I'm making sure to leave myself at least a quarter inch space on each side. Overall, I made three trees, rinsed off the washaway stabilizer, and trimmed the veiling with scissors. What did you have in mind for the different colors? When I was planning the colors, I was thinking that the light would be coming from the left. The tallest goes in the middle, and it has kind of a medium green color. I'm putting the darkest one down on the right, since I think it would get the most shade. The final one I added some highlighting to because of the sunlight, and it goes on the left. Eventually, I might want to add some highlights to the others, or just a center tree. I think the right is smallest. No, this left tree is the shortest, but it is also the fluffiest. You want to be aware of what's behind it, too. It's a shame to cover up all of the background tree line. You can adjust the trees a bit to let certain parts show better, and some of it will show through the trees regardless. You don't want it too symmetrical, but you do want it balanced. For example, if I put this one closer to the middle tree, you'll see more of the background here. And I think I like it down a little so the mountain shows a little more. You also don't want to cover up the ledge area we took the time to sew. I'm going to use the Roxanne basting glue again, like I did putting down the appliques on the background. Did that clog up? Usually it stays pretty open. If it clogs a little, you can use a bent pin or something to unstick it. You don't have to glue this too hard. It's not like a fabric applique. You'll mostly be able to hold it down with your fingers as you stitch it on. And the Roxanne glue is a basting glue that dries clear and washes out. Right, so you might not want to use it on something you're not going to wash. If you get a little glue coming through, you can use a paper towel to mop it up. Now, let's let that dry and we'll be ready to stitch down the trees. I'm using Superior Mono Poly to stitch down the trees and just a regular 60 weight poly in the bobbin. I set the stitch regulator to 12 stitches per inch. Should I lower the tension a bit? Mono poly tends to be fussy. Let's see, I was practicing yesterday and the tension seemed about right. In addition to stitching around the edges, I'm kind of meandering over the tree to get it thoroughly stitched down. If you're using a regular circle free motion foot like I am, 
You want to watch that the evergreen needles or the tree don't get caught in the foot. If so, you might have to clip them a little and then reset your thread. Monopoly is a little hard to see and thread into the needle, so sometimes I use a loop of dental floss to help me get it threaded. This is the main reason I don't like to work with Monopoly unless I have to, because I can't really see it. But for something like this, it's really useful because it disappears. To get between trees, I just stitch in the ditch along the applique background tree line. Off camera, I sandwiched the quilt for quilting, using the same process I demonstrated in most of my videos, using Sulky KK2000 Temporary Spray Adhesive for basting. The batting is an 80-20 cotton poly batting by Quilter's Dream, and the backing fabric is kind of a cream-colored quilting cotton. You still have mono poly set up from stitching down the trees. Is that what you want here too? Yes, I'm going to start with that to outline the trees so they stand out a little. Now it's time to do a little basting. I've set the stitch regulator to BSR mode 3 for you. For both the basting and my new bit of quilting, I'm using a 116 top stitch needle. For all these thick layers of material, you want to use a needle a size larger than you would normally use. I'm going to start by quilting out a stone pattern on the rocky foreground. For this, you have the stitch regulator set back to BSR mode 1 at 10 stitches per inch. Right now, you have the idle speed at 250, but let me know if you want to raise it. Thanks, I probably will once I get going.
For the mountains, I'm mostly echoing the horizon lines using 40 weight polyester threads that match the color of the background fabric. But I'm adding a few swirls in for interest in the larger areas. The sky is just quilted with a loose meander with a mostly horizontal orientation. We could do something fancier here, but this gives a kind of airy, breezy feel. This is a really straightforward binding. I cut and folded the binding strips from the same medium green cotton I used for one of the mountains, and it should pair well with the rest of the quilt. I'm marking a quarter inch from the corner with a washable pen, so I'll know exactly where to stop it and fold it. rounding the next corner.
Now it's time to connect the ends of the binding strip. At this point, I loosen the seam guide and get it out of the way. I want to unfold it so I can lay it flat and sew across it. It's useful to mark it because it's easy to sew the wrong direction. I want to mark from one edge to the other edge, corner to corner. This sewing is kind of tricky because the quilt itself is fighting you as you try and keep the binding flat. If you have trouble with binding, the Susan Cleveland class in Craftsy is one I highly recommend. She also has a book presenting the same information. And before you cut this, you always want to test that it's going to be right. Now it's time to sew the binding from the front. I have it clipped down and I'm using decorative stitch number 766. I often use this one to close a binding because it has a straight edge on the seam side but it goes around and catches everything so the binding stays put. If I were doing a competition quilt, I would have started stitching to the front and then hand sewed it to the back because it's more traditional and what show judges will expect. A general rule of thumb for show quilts you're expected to be able to do things the hard way, whatever that is. Hope you enjoyed this project. I always enjoy landscape quilting and this time I got to show you a completely new method for making trees. And don't forget, for those who haven't already subscribed, please do, and remember to click the like button if you enjoyed this video. I'd also like to say thanks again to those of you who have already subscribed. Having more subscribers join and comment has really been an encouragement for me to keep making new projects and new content. And of course, if you have any questions, comments, or ideas for what you'd like to see in the future projects, please post them below, and I'll try and get back to you as soon as possible. Until next time, have fun in your studios!